with me now We're going to study economic growth today, and one thing you'll note on the picture on the slide is that North Korea and South Korea are totally different nations today. They used to be identical. So what is the big difference? Well, we've had economic growth in South Korea, but not in North Korea, and so we're going to discuss those differences today. All right, so you're going to understand the effects of capital on economic growth, and then we're mainly going to cover the solo growth model in this video. All right. So the causes of economic growth. Now, we've already discussed this in the past when we looked at our production possibility curve. We would say that it will shift outward whenever you have more resources or more technology. Today, we're also going to discover that strong institutions will also cause growth. Now, what do we mean by institutions? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go forward. Okay? But here's where, this is where, uh, this is an example where you could see how uh, more resources or new technology can, can cause growth. So if you just look at um, uh, milk production over the last, oh gosh, almost 100 years, um, we actually had the most dairy cows that we've ever had in this country in the year 1940, okay? We had 2.4 million. But if you look at 1940, the actual production of milk was pretty low. Today we have fewer cows, but we have more milk. So why? Well, we've had advancements in automation, we've had veterinary technology, genetics, um, hormones, antibiotics, all kinds of things that have helped us to produce more milk. That's what we mean by economic growth. Okay? So technology allows us to grow because it, it allows you to get more from your existing resources. Okay? But here's the thing. We, we, you know, the technology exists throughout the world. But why do some areas innovate and grow more than others? Why did the United States grow and innovate while Africa didn't? So that means that we're probably missing something from this growth equation with regard to Africa. And so that's where we come in with institutions. So what did I mean by institutions? I'm talking about law and order, private property rights, an efficient government, um, regulations that work and not hinder um, businesses. Um, all kinds of institutions. I mean, you could think of anything. It could be customs. It could be traditions. It could be, um, uh, you know, just just all you know social aspects within our within our culture. I mean, it's all kinds of things like that. So, more specifically, the important institutions for economic growth are these: political stability. What if we had a dictator running our country, and every few years he was deposed? Do you think that would create a, a business environment where, where businesses would want to invest? I would think not. Um, same with rule of law. You like to have a predictable regulatory regime so that if, you're, if you start a business, you know what the law is and you know the law is not going to change. Okay, so it's predictable. Private property rights are very important um, because people respond to incentives. If they have private property rights, that means that they're going to take care of their property so that their property can benefit them the most. Uh, you got to have stable money. Um, you know, we've, we've discussed that before. Hyperinflation totally will destroy the incentive to, to innovate. You've got to have competitive markets. Comp competition just makes everybody get better. Okay? It keeps prices low. It you know, forces people to compete to, to make the best product they can. We should have efficient taxes. This is actually a very big topic coming up this election. Um, some people want to tax based on fairness. Um, others want to tax more to provide economic growth. Well, efficient taxes means you, you maximize the revenue to the government so the government can perform its functions. But at the same time, you don't take so much from the private sector that the private sector loses incentive to innovate, produce, and grow the economy. Um, international trade, we've discussed that. You know, if we trade based on comparative advantage, you're going to be able to get more from your existing resources, and so that would cause economic growth. And then finally, the flow of funds across borders. All this is referring to is something that we've already discussed. Our loanable funds market, the supply of those funds comes from us as savers in our households, but it also comes from foreigners saving their funds here in the United States. So that's what's meant by number seven. 
So if you actually look at this, we're not gonna we're gonna we're not gonna look at all of those in great detail, but let's just look at raw uh, the rule of law and how that affects income in the world. Okay, if you look at this graph, what it's showing on the y-axis is better enforcement of the rule of law. So the better the enforcement of the rule of law, the higher the income is in that particular country. So a country like the U.S. would be over here because we have strong rule of law, whereas maybe, I don't know, think of a country over here on the right, you know, just be some, heck, I don't know, how about uh, Haiti? Haiti would probably be something like that. All right, that leads us to the next thing. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about a production function. Okay, all this is is it's, it's a mathematical function that demonstrates how economic growth is tied to various um, other variables. Um, the one that you're looking at right now, the variable used is capital. Okay, so it relates investment to real GDP growth. Okay, whoops, backwards. So, what causes growth? We talked about resources. We talked about technology, and then we're gonna we're introducing institutions now. Those are all the sources of economic growth. The model to the right only looks at um, capital in respect with resources, and then advancements in capital can also be uh, technology. All right, so uh, you don't have to know this guy. His name's Robert Solo, but he came up with the Solo growth model. This model still forms the basis of growth theory, so if you take an economics class in college, you're, you're probably going to discuss the solo growth model in, in more detail than we're giving it today. So let's begin with our production function. Okay, it's just the relationship between the inputs to production and the output that is that production. And for our purposes, output is GDP. So if we looked at this as an equation, now this isn't, this isn't a crazy math equation, but basically we'll say that income, the letter Y is income. I don't know if you all remember that. But the letter Y stands for income, which is GDP, and it is a function, so the letter F, of our physical capital, our human capital, that means labor resources, and then our other natural resources. So those are our resources. So in a very simple production function, what we can produce is based upon our resources. So the more resources we have, the greater growth we will have, and then up to a point. So what do we mean by up to a point? We're about to talk about something called the marginal product. In this case, of capital is what we're about to talk about. Uh, the abbreviation in economics for capital is the letter K. All right, so we can focus on, on physical capital as a, as a driver for economic growth. So the first version of the solo model actually focused exclusively on capital rather than other resources like labor or energy costs, things like that. Why would they do that? Well, it's actually very simple. If you increase the tools available, you're going to increase the amount of production each worker can, can put together. Okay? So for example, what if we had to go outside and help the landscapers uh, with some projects? So our econ class project is to move this dirt from point A to point B. Now, this is a very simple question. Would we be more productive with shovels or just using our hands? Doesn't it stand to reason that the more shovels we have, the more productive we will be? So let's start adding shovels. Let's see, there's nine shovels, 12, 15 shovels, 18 shovels, 21 shovels. You know, 21 shovels, that means each one of us in the class will have a shovel. That's good. Let's keep adding shovels, though. Now we have 24. 27, we've got 30 shovels, 33 shovels. So once we reach more shovels than we can actually use, does each additional shovel really add to our production? Or does it just, I mean, once we hit the 21st shovel, I mean, that's it, right? Well, that's the idea of marginal product, okay? Marginal product is the change in output divided by our change in an input, okay? We're going to assume that the marginal product of capital, of labor, of uh, other natural resources is some number greater than zero. For our example, what we just did is if we were to add 10 shovels and we were to increase our output by 20 tons of dirt, then our marginal product of capital 
is two tons per additional shovel. See how that works? Now, once we hit the 21st shovel, we're not moving more dirt. We reach what we'll, we'll call in a second a steady state. Okay? So generally speaking, though, increasing inputs will increase output up to a point. Okay? So let's do an example. I don't know if you've seen the movie Cast Away, but we're going to look at Chuck's production function. Okay? Uh, his production, his GDP, is fruit. So gathering fruit is, is what his GDP is. His resources include the fruit trees and bamboo. Uh, his human capital is him. And then his physical capital is a bamboo ladder. Okay? So let's see what he can do. All right, will the ladder help him gather fruit? Absolutely, because the fruit's up high. What about a second ladder? Now, even though Chuck's just one person, a second ladder might actually help him produce more fruit because then he doesn't have to move ladders as often. You know, he can set it up on one tree, have another ladder on another tree, then he doesn't have to spend time moving the ladder. So a second ladder could also help him increase production. The second ladder, though, is not going to increase fruit production by as much as the first one, okay? Can't do that. Um, the reason is because he can't use both ladders at the same time. He can use them one after another, and he can save time by not moving them, okay? Uh, Wilson, I don't know if you all know him, but he can't use a ladder, so that, that's not going to do anything. So what we're, what we're going to end up demonstrating is that he gets less production from his second ladder than he does from his first one, which is the principle of diminishing marginal productivity, okay? Now, the, the marginal product of, of additional ladders is greater than zero. However, it, it, it becomes smaller with each successive ladder. And here's what I'm, what I'm talking about, okay? Let's, let's use a production function to illustrate this. All right, here's our production function. And what it does is it shows you how much output of fruit comes from each additional ladder. So the first ladder, let's get some color here. The first ladder allows him to produce four bushels of output. Now, without a ladder at all, he was producing one. So his marginal product of the first ladder is three bushels of fruit, okay? Then his second ladder, now he's up here, the second ladder allowed him to add an additional two bushels of fruit. And then his third ladder allowed him to save time and produce one additional bushel of fruit. And then the fourth ladder didn't do anything, okay? So the marginal product of the first ladder was three, the marginal product of the second ladder was two, the marginal product of the third ladder is one, and the marginal product of his fourth ladder is actually zero. So that is what we mean by diminishing marginal productivity, okay? So this is on graph form. We could also look at that same information in table form, and it demonstrates to you that with zero ladders, uh, he gets one bushel of output. With one ladder, he now gets four. So the marginal product is three. He went from one to four. The second ladder gives him six. That means his output goes from four to six, so the marginal product is plus two. And then the third ladder is plus one, and then the last one is zero, okay? So that's what we mean by uh, diminishing marginal productivity. Then, if you look, once he hits that fourth ladder, that means additional capital is not going to improve his output. That is what we will start referring to as a steady state. Okay, that means the economy is stable and there's no additional growth. So something new has to happen. Okay, let's go. Here's an example of, of something that would improve economic growth. You know, back in the 1950s and 60s, we started building these interstate highways, which are really awesome. Okay, do you think that that advancement, that advancement in transportation brought about efficiencies to production? It absolutely did. It, it helps producers get uh, their products to market and their raw materials to their factories. So it really does help. Okay. So steady states. At some point, additional ladders or shovels do not add to our production. Okay. In fact, you all probably noticed that with ladder four in Chuck's example and our 22nd through 33rd shovel with our moving dirt example. So a steady state is defined as the long run equilibrium where no new in, where there is no new investment 
and there is no change in capital stock or real income at that point. So marginal product of capital decreases. So there eventually will be no positive net return to more investment, even if the cost of capital is zero. So that means there's no incentive to invest if the cost of investment is greater than the return on investment. That's what we mean by steady state. That's when you're, you're kind of done growing because you don't have anything new, okay? So the steady state means we have tapped out our growth potential with existing technology. We can add more capital, but it begins to not matter anymore, okay? So this area here is what we would refer to as reaching the steady state, all right? Um, a little couple notes on investment. You all know what investment is. That's the purchase of capital. What I don't think we have discussed yet is the term depreciation. Depreciation is when that capital loses value over time, okay? Um, things wear out, okay? Old factories become outdated, machines wear down, roads crumble. That is what is meant by depreciation. So what we're really concerned about, when we talk about investment, we, we want investment. But what we really want is something called net investment to be positive, okay? Net investment in, the, in equation form is basically, let me write this down, you have gross investment minus depreciation equals net investment. If you have positive net investment, that means that you're adding to the capital stock um, of your country. So for example, the capital stock is this block. Okay, think of that as a bulldozer, all right, or a couple of lawnmowers, something like that, just some machines. During the year, some of those machines wear out. That's what we call depreciation, okay? So during the year, businesses are going to replace capital. Sometimes they'll even add more capital than they had before. Whatever they do, whatever capital they add is called gross investment, but gross investment is made up of depreciation and net investment, so as long as the gross investment is bigger than the depreciation, then you have positive net investment. And we add that positive net investment to our existing capital stock. And so if you think about it, in 2015, we had this much capital. But now in 2016, we have this much, which is, is more. So you would expect to see additional growth. OK? Now, a couple, couple uh, notes with the solo growth model. If we have these things called steady states, that means at some point in time, most countries should catch up to other countries, okay? That, that is what we uh, term convergence, okay? It's the idea that over time, uh, per capita GDP levels across nations will equalize, so the, the entire world will be equal, okay? So let's, let's move on here. Convergence theory suggests this. Okay, since, since many nations begin to slow down right here, and then other nations are, are in this area where they have really high growth, that means at some point in time, all countries should become equal. Okay, think of it as, well, here's our example, the United States and China. China's growing really fast. The U.S. is growing slow. Okay, but here's another way to think about it. Do you remember when your little brother was half your size? Well, once you hit college age and your little brother starts hitting college age, guess what? He might be bigger than you, or y'all could be the same size. That's what we mean by convergence, okay? So little Bobby's growing up. All right. The thing is, though, is that uh, we haven't really seen that, okay? If we would see convergence, then Haiti and Germany would be equal, okay? Or North American economies wouldn't be really any different from African ones, Okay. But we still have higher growth in wealthy nations. So there's not really any sign of convergence, even though our models would predict that to happen. So there's something missing. And the things missing are these, okay? You got technology and strong institutions. So it's not just capital. That's the point, okay? Um, let me skip that. So here we have, we're gonna, we're gonna look at why it is Africa has really tiny GDP, and the rest of the world does not, okay? So we, we do know that capital causes economic growth, okay? However, capital alone is not enough, so there's something extra, okay? 
So we have a second solo growth model, and that's where we add technology. Okay, and that makes sense. You know, technology makes your capital more productive. Technology makes your labor more productive. Everything's more productive. So we're going to now, let's say we, we're here at a steady state, but then the introduction of new capital will actually shift the solo um, curve up, which is just a production function. So the, the new technology allows you to produce more goods and services with your existing resources. All right. So how do we add that? Well, we already had physical capital, human capital, natural resources. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add this little letter A. The little letter A stands for labor augmenting technology. Okay? And so it is, it's just a way to increase the slope of the, of the production function as well as shifting it up a little bit. Okay? So basically, the, the technology affects the physical capital, it affects the human capital or, or labor, and the technology allows us to get more from our natural resources. So it's not a resource by itself. Instead, it, it, it acts upon the other resources in our equation. Okay? So we've added technology. That means that our, our effective labor is more productive. More, more education shifts the production function upward, which is similar to technological advance, advances. Okay? Um, when we talk about per capita GDP, remember that's divided by the population. So one of the reasons our per capita GDP might be not growing as fast as, as it could is because we do have a lot of immigration. Let's see. Let's keep going here. This is this. this, is this I want to think of a cycle of poverty. If you're a poor nation, do you have extra money to invest in capital? The answer is no. You don't have money for saving. Therefore, there's no money for capital, which means there's no new development, which means you stay poor, okay? So that's no bueno. Saving poor, 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 poor. All right, and then we've, we've seen this uh, in other lessons, so I'm going to skip this. All right, last part, modern growth theory. So we're going to add to it now. It's not just capital, and it's not just technology, okay? Now we have to look at something additional. So, so we've discovered that technological change is actually something that's already built into our model, so it's not something that we can add, okay, because technology is constantly being added. So we're going to add institutions to our, to our um, model, all right? Positive institutions are going to increase economic growth, whereas negative institutions will slow it down. Some examples of negative institutions, corruption, political instability, um, these are all reasons why a lot of Latin American countries don't, don't grow as quickly as they should, okay? Because we all started out pretty much equal in the year, I don't know, 1775-ish. Um, and same thing with Africa. There's lots of corruption, political instability in Africa, okay? So we're adding that now as a variable to our production function, institutions, Okay. So, to wrap it up, strong institutions promote and lead to growth-friendly incentives, okay? Remember, you have your private property rights. You're going you're gonna to take care of your property so you can use your property to produce things. Um, think of the golden goose. If you own the golden goose, you're going to take care of it. It's going to lay you golden eggs, you know, perfect. Um, if you don't own the golden goose, you might, stri you might try to force it to lay as many eggs as possible and wear it out, and eventually it could die, okay? So growth-friendly incentives gives you the profit potential that leads to investment. Investment in physical capital, human capital, new technologies, okay, which leads to economic growth. The economic growth creates a positive cycle where you now can take the money you've earned and buy more capital, get more education, get better technology. And so the cycle perpetuates, and so that's why you have wealthy nations continuing to have strong economic growth, and sometimes poor um, third world countries with corruption and bad governance, you'll see them having uh, no growth. So there you go. That's, we just discussed the solo growth model.